thing is a good thing. When I was a number of years ago out in Denver with Jason Jans, uh, I was visiting his church and actually picked up a Bible, and I've used a hardcover Bible ever since. <laughs> so I always pray for Jason Jans when I use my hardcover uh, Bible. And I did write him and apologize for stealing it, and he said it was okay, but I uh, uh, did that. I want to, today we're going to introduce to you our, uh, uh, the concept of uh, adding additional elders to our church. Uh, we've been a year now, roughly since uh, our last Church Matters series, that uh, we t- went through uh, with you in Church Matters the whole concept of switching governance model from a senior pastor model to an elder model. And it's something that's been going on uh, for a while. The, the deacons and the elders actually took time to process the bylaws for a good period of time before it ever got to you. And then last year we went through it with you, and obviously you said and voted then in September to proceed with this. And it's, it's been for us uh, a, a, a great journey, not without its trials, not without its struggles. I always think in these terms, a number of years ago when I had a chance to just teach through the book of Hebrews, there were three principles that I learned in Hebrews that I find to be true all the time. One is, the new is always better than the old. Nobody, everybody shakes their head at that. But the new is always better than the old. The Old Testament, the New Testament, and Hebrews teaches you that the new is better than the old. And really, it's a, it's a truth that's just true. In almost every area, the new is always better than the old. But we tend to say, but the good old days. You know, churches that look to the good old days are churches that are in the process of dying. Churches that don't believe that the new is better than the old are in trouble. But churches that believe that the new is better than the old are churches that are on the move. It's a very critical principle to to understanding Church, the second principle that Hebrews teaches is that the future is always better than the past. And for us, it always is. The best part of the journey for us lies yet ahead. And that's an important principle for, understand, for churches to maintain because churches that are looking back are churches that are really in trouble. But churches that understand the future is the best part of the trip. And Hebrews teaches us that the future is better than the past. But Hebrews teaches us another interesting principle, and that's this. The transitions are killers. The transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament was a very difficult transition. It's a whole new way of worship. You think you're going through worship changes. The generation that went through real worship changes was those that were used to coming to the temple with all of their sacrifices and all of their systems, and all of a sudden the next week you don't need that anymore. Because Christ died on the cross, and once he died on the cross, that whole sacrificial system of the Old Testament was done away with. How'd you like to go through that transition? (laughs) But transitions, so transitions are always fun to walk through, and there's always processes that have to, you, you process through, and they just take time to work through, and they take adjustment on the part of everybody. And so we've gone through that for this past year and are still in the process of going through that. And there's always some things that are great and there's always some things that are troubling. I get that question all the time. I get, people come up to me that I don't see for some time and they say, how's the church doing? I say, what day is it? And I said, well, the honest answer to that is this. Well, there's always good things and there's always difficult things. There's always trials and there's always blessings. Which do you want to know about? How's the church doing? Well, it's the Lord's church. It's always doing good because he takes care of it. And so, you, what, you know, you want to stand there and paint a positive picture. You just want a positive picture of how the church is doing. Well, it's doing good. And faith at Sellersville is doing good. It's been, a, it's been fun over the last couple of years because of things that we've been through, planning a church, sending out guys to plant churches from Pastor Tim to Pastor John and John Wright going and just transitions that we've been through over the past couple years. I still remember standing up when we planted the church in in the Upper Perk area saying to you this, for the next couple years, you're going to feel like, bleh, bleh. 
What's happened? Ugh, what, you know, will we ever get going again? Well, the answer is yes, we will. It just takes time to adjust. It takes time for new leaders, new workers to emerge. It takes time to go through that. And what's great now is having gone through that and come through that and to see things here begin to fall into place, begin to happen, and now to see God just sending new people our way and to see the energy return to faith is, is like refreshing and very exciting. And so I can really say is, again, I said, I believe in it the whole way through, just wondering, you know, at what point does this happen that the future is better than the past? It is the best part of our journey and that the new is better than the old, but transitions are difficult. But it's time for us to go through some more. And I just want to take some time this morning, and then Pastor Doug's going to come and just present some stuff to you this morning in our Church Matter series. And we want to focus on the subject this morning of adding lay elders to what is already there. I think as we go through this, uh, later in 2013, obviously you approved the bylaws, and a time has come for us to begin the process. And what we want to get across to you today is that this is a process that we want to go through. And we want to be very careful in the process because we want to do it right. And so we want to just say this morning, I want to review with you a simple review of some basic thoughts. And then Pastor Doug's going to share with you the process that we think we need to walk through. Now I want to just kind of talk to you a minute about what a biblical elder, and I want to just review this. I want to start with you on what a biblical elder is not. What a biblical elder is not. And I just want to say a couple things to you. First of all, a biblical elder is not a representative of the people. This is not an American form of government. This is not a democracy. This is not a republic. You're not selecting people who can represent you as the elders. That's not what this is. An elder, rather, is a spokesman for God. See? And I think that's important for us to understand. Does, can you go talk to these people? Absolutely. Yes. At any point, at any time, you're always welcome to come to any of us that are elders. And I understand even with deacons, but deacons aren't representatives either. Deacons aren't go-between between between anybody. Deacons really are people that are called by God to a specific office to fulfill duties in the church that need to be done so that elders can stay focused on what elders do and the church can stay focused on its mission. So when deacons do their job, you can do your job and we can do our job and they can do their job. And it's a great system that really Christ set up. Elders are not professionals. I always like what uh, Piper's book that he read. Some of you may have read it a couple years ago when he came out. John Piper came out with a book that said, Brethren, we are not professionals. We're not. Rather, we are simply sinners called by God to fulfill a responsibility and an office that Christ set up for his church but we realize our own sinfulness. We realize our own limitations. And we recognize the fact that we're not professionals. We're simply people that have been gifted by God for a specific task that he wants done in his church. So we don't look at ourselves as a professional. We're not power brokers. We're not here to exercise power. We're not here to, oh yeah. It's not what it's about. In fact, we often talk as in, in, in our meetings, we often talk when we're concerned about territory or if we're concerned about territorialism or we're concerned about our authority or we're concerned about this or that, we're missing something. Because the idea of this is that we're not power brokers. Rather, we're to be servants willing to wash the feet of people. That's what elders are. We're your servants. And that he would, who would be the greatest among you would be your servant. 
And so we simply desire to serve God, and we desire to serve you by representing and presenting God's truth to you. When I drive here on Sunday mornings, I sometimes get brokenhearted because, I, and this morning was one of those, when I come out of the community and I live in, I see all the people out working on their house and working on their gardens and mowing their lawns and doing different things, and I think, man, they're just living their life without God. And I start thinking about what would it be like for me to live my life without God? And then I come back and I say, I'm so thankful for the gospel, and I'm so thankful for Sunday school teachers that taught me here. The time I go see, when I saw Sue Scharf was visiting Mary Coon the other day, it was neat to see Mary at the, at the home down in Rock Hill. Mary Coon was one of my Sunday school teachers that taught me when I was just a little guy here. And I've been able to grow up, and most of what I know about the Scriptures has come as a result of this church and people in this church that have inputted into my life and taught me. And not only did you instill in me the Scriptures, but you instilled in me a passion to want to do ministry. And that passion still remains today to want to see this church and to want to see your life used and my life used to really make an impact in the world in which we live. Isn't that neat? And so we're here to serve you. And we pray that as we serve that you'll sense from us a heart of humility and a heart that considers it a great, great privilege to serve you in this capacity. Not, hey, I get to, yeah, I get to rule over you. Yeah, I get to rule over you. But only with the Word of God. And only does the Word of God rule over us, not me. If I rule over you, I got it wrong. If any of us rule over you, we got it wrong. But if we take the Word of God and present it to you and let the Word of God rule over you, then we've done our task that we're supposed to do. So elders are not power brokers. We're also not fundraisers. <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the most difficult tasks in a, in a church is just, you know, financing what could be done and, and getting people to, to get on board with giving and want to encourage you to do that. But we're not fundraisers. The only one that knows how to get in your pocket and get it out of there is really Christ himself. But when he touches your pocket, it's going to open up. <laughs> Closing it will be the hard part <laughs> when he gets your heart. So elders are not representatives of the people, rather the spokesmen for God. And as we start this process of looking for people that we want to present, and then you as a church, as Pastor Doug will mention to you in a little bit, begin the process of evaluating, because you're going to be as engaged in this as anybody, because these are people that you're going to have to approve and say, we recognize in these individuals and we see in these individuals the gift and the calling of God in their life that they're not a representative of the people, but they're a spokesman for God. And they're not professionals, but rather just ordinary men who have a walk with God that you recognize that there's something there that is unique and special, that they are not power brokers in the church. We're not after that. They're even, not even the, you know, we don't, it's not even business qualifications that, you don't want to take business people and put them in as elders because they're good business people. That, we don't want that. Although good business people may make good elders, but not because they're good business people, but because they're God called and they have the gift and the calling of God upon our life, and we want you to see that as much as anybody up here would see that. They're not fundraisers, but they're capable of teaching the Word of God when it comes to giving. So what do biblical elders do to sum it up real briefly? And then give you a big list. There's five basic responsibilities that are summarized in the task. It's one of oversight of the church, protection of the church, discipline in the church, instruction in the church, and direction in the church. So we want to be able to identify among us, and they're here, because I think God has put them here, people that have that sense of overseeing the church without wanting to exercise power. Peter, in 1 Peter 5, would really 
nip that one in the bud, not lording it over them, but voluntarily serving. People that understand protecting the church from false teaching and false doctrine. People that understand discipline, the necessity at times to take those who have lives have kind of veered off and be able to say, come on, get back on track. Or if necessary, because a life is veered off and it's totally unrepentant to say, you can't be a part of our fellowship. Because we can't have people that are part of the fellowship who refuse to submit themselves to the word of God. And then people who provide instruction and capable of taking the word of God and presenting it to you. And then people who understand where Christ wants to take the church. One church identified elders' responsibilities in this way. What do elders do? Give you this real quick list. And I, they pray and study the word, Acts chapter 6, verse 4. They rule and lead the church, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. They care for the people in the church, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 to 5. They give an account to God for the church, Hebrews 13, verse 17. They live as examples to the flock, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. They rightly use God-given authority in the church, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. They teach the Bible, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. They proclaim and preach the word, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. They pray, they anoint the sick, James chapter 5, verse 14. They refute false teaching, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. They rightly use money and power, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. They discipline unrepentant believers, Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. And they develop other leaders and teachers, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And then a couple last thoughts before my part's done here is what do biblical elders, what do lay elders do? What is the value of lay elders to the church? What are lay elders? Just so you know. We're considered vocational elders. You pay us. Scripture would support that in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. There are those that are worthy of double honor. So Scripture would support paying Lay elders are those who work in other positions but yet have the gifts and the calling. And so what do lay elders do in the church and what is the value that lay elders bring to the church? Let me suggest to you four things this morning because my time is limited. Their value is this, first of all, because it's a biblical concept. And following the scriptures always has value to the church. And we've always tried to be a church that does this, follow the scriptures wherever they take us. Second thing, it lightens the load in the church. Shepherding here is a large task, and it lightens the load by other hands being involved. Third value to it, it brings, I think, greater perspective. Those of us who work here, those of us who are part of what we call the vocational staff here, what happens is, is this. Those of us who work here have an inside-to-outside perspective because we're here all the time. Our perspective is inside, and then we look out. One of the values that I think lay elders bring is they don't have the inside-out perspective. They have the outside-in perspective, and that's a good thing because sometimes when you're involved in it, you don't always see things that other people see. And to be able to have together a group of men who labor together, some who see it from inside out and some who see it from outside in, will give a balance that I think will help us immensely to be able to see it. And the last thing I would give you is simply this. There's a deeper level of accountability. It's one of the things that we've seen changed over the last uh, year is there's a deeper level of accountability amongst us that work and serve here now as elders, and that's true. And that's been a good thing. It's been a good thing. And what you get, I think, and the value of this is there is wisdom in the multitude of counselors, right? So in the days ahead, Pastor Doug will come and share with you the process that uh, we want to present to you as we walk forward in, in, in this whole thing. All right, thank you, Pastor Paul. We have uh, sat down and 
just mapped out the uh, way in which we want to go about by looking out amongst um, our congregation of members um, for men who would, who would um, be able to serve in this capacity. And so, um, I thank Pastor Paul for what he said and uh, just identifying the role of an elder, what it is and what it isn't. I, I think sometimes that can get confusing as, as we just engage in the business and the ministry and the life of the church. Um, and, and especially when you think of lay elders as opposed to vocational elders, the, um, the vocational elders, uh, those of us that are here day in, day out, um, you know, this is what we feel God's called us to do with our vocation. And uh, so, therefore, we went and got training to do that. Uh, we went to seminary, and we, we spent time there getting the training. Um, the lay elders maybe won't be seminary trained, you know, men, okay? But they will um, possess the gifts and the calling, and that'll be evaluated through the process I'm going to go, you through, go through with you right now. So, let's, um, let's go through the process right now, if I can get my computer to work. The lay eldership process we see is probably going to be a three to six month process. Now, that's just a, a number that, uh, a time frame that we came up with from identifying to actually voting on, on, on men that we'd bring before you, um, anywhere from three months to six months, and you'll see why um, that process is, is uh, taking that long. Um, as, as we go through it, there's been a couple questions about, okay, so we voted in September for a new model. We voted for the four men, myself, Paul, Pastor Paul Auckland, uh, Paul Peralt, Ron Jones. Um, why haven't we uh, appointed any new lay elders? Really just a couple of reasons to uh, give you. Uh, first of all, um, this is a brand new form of church governance for us, and uh, we only have one lay elder, Ron Jones, right now. And so we wanted to uh, make sure that the, we were going to bring new lay elders on in a, in a time of health, uh, not in a time of, of difficulty and trying to figure stuff out. And so we've taken eight months to um, meet, to discuss, to plan out, and to really pray and see the future regarding men who would be in this office of leadership. And so that's been a process that we've been going through, navigating the, the, the lay elder in relation to the vocational elder. Okay, those of us that are here every day working, making decisions, as opposed to um, like Ron, who's got a job with the school, even though he's here in this building, his, his focus during the week is on the school, not the church. And so any lay elder that comes on board, their focus every, every day is going to be their, their their secular job that they're in. So how do we how do we work it between those of us that are vocational and those of us that um, are not vocational? So we've been uh, through the past eight months working through that and uh, navigating that. And uh, so what we want to do first is uh, pretty simple. As elders, we just want to identify men as possible candidates. And so in doing that, uh, these will be uh, men who have been serving teaching and already making disciples in our church. And so, as we look out from among us, we're looking at men who have a track record, who, who seem to have this, this calling, this, this um, giftedness that would uh, qualify them to serve in this office. And so, we're going to be looking at, at men who, who, man, they're already serving. The heartbeat's there. Um, they have an ability to teach and uh, because the aptitude to teach is one of the qualifications. And so these are men that, that possess that. And then those who are just uh, making disciples already, serving the body, ministering to the body, um, we're going to be looking for those types of individuals uh, as we uh, look for possible candidates. Um, there are also going to be men who we feel uh, meet those biblical qualifications that the, the Bible sets forth. And so that's just the first step. Identify some individuals that we feel can... Um, begin the process, and then who are willing to begin that process. We may approach men who, who say, uh, not for me. Um, I appreciate it, but I'm just not called into that. And so, these will be men who meet those qualifications, who are already serving, who, who say, yeah, let me, uh, let me take the next step. Um, we want to take this process really, really carefully. Uh, we want to appoint the men that God would have for us. We don't want to rush guys in just because uh, it, it seems like a need at the time. What we want to do is we want to be very careful that God's in this process and that we take time to um, really allow men to make that decision. The idea of being in a, a position of leadership and authority to some people may be very appealing at first, but once you realize what it actually entails, it's not um, the easiest thing. Uh, leadership, and those of you that 
that even in your jobs or in positions of leadership, you know that that comes with a lot of difficulty. This is why we pay our managers a little bit more and the CEO gets paid the most, right? Because the weight of responsibility that's upon them is greater than the others. And so, what happens is when you assume responsibility in regards to leadership over the church, what's placed upon you is a heavy, heavy, heavy weight of responsibility that you go to bed with every night. You don't just take it off. Um, um, You take it with you. You don't just leave the office at the end of the day and and, and not take that in with you into your home. The, the weight and, and, and the care, even the Apostle Paul talks about, I've worked and I've labored, and on top of that, I have the weight and the care of the churches. And so there's just this weight that falls upon men's shoulders that you just carry with you. And, and I can't explain it any other way than that. Unless you've been in that position, you just maybe can't quite understand, but just, just hear me on this. The weight that elders carry is a heavy weight, and it's not for everybody. It's It's not. And so I tell young men aspiring to ministry all the time, if you can see yourself doing any other thing, then please pursue that. Because what God does when He calls men to serve and lead the church in this capacity is He places upon them a huge weight of responsibility, which requires a huge weight of accountability, which requires you to um, be a man who's going to uh, serve with integrity, but also a complete dependence upon God. Because it's not necessarily an easy office to fill. It's, it's really not. It can be very difficult. So, um, men who would fill that office, we want to we want to be very careful with uh, with moving forward. And so, um, as we go on, the next step after identifying men is taking time to identify the gifts and the calling. And in this, we uh, are just going to ask candidates to attend our monthly elder meetings to observe, sit there and. Listen to what we're talking about. Listen to how those things go. Listen to the, the, the decisions that are made, the, the accountability that happens, the confrontations. I mean, uh, Pastor Paul mentioned that uh, there's been a, a high level of accountability amongst our elder team, and that's, that's actually true. We've had some meetings where we've had to look each other in the eye and have some difficult conversations, and that's not an easy thing. We've also had meetings where we just sit and rejoice over what God is doing. And so, what we want is for men to come in and experience that atmosphere. We want them to experience this is what it's really like so that they can sit there and say, whoa, I didn't know you guys had to deal with that kind of… I mean, listen, the business of the church and, and the business of people's lives is a messy thing, all right? Lives are messy. Your lives are messy. My life is messy. And, and, as, and as leaders in the church, oftentimes we're called upon into the mess. I mean, I, I, I could sit here and in my my 11 years, even on staff here, the phone calls I've gotten, the, the situations I've had to step into, um, when people are going through crisis, who do they call? They call their spiritual leaders. They call their pastors. So we step into the crisis of people's lives all the time, and that's difficult and that's tough, but that's one of the things that God's called us to do. Um, we step into the mess of the church, the dealings with the church, the how do we make decisions moving forward? How do you get a congregation to buy into vision moving forward? Those things are very difficult. And so you want men to be able to experience a time where they, they know, okay, this is what is entailed with holding this office. And uh, this is what we have to grasp so that they can sit and say, I don't think so, not for me. Great. We need to know that now. Or, you know what? For whatever reason, I may be crazy, but I'm drawn to that. <laughs> and and those, those men that are like, wow, you, you, you would, you're going to sacrifice so much of your time and energy and emotions to serve the church in that capacity, you're crazy. And, and to some degree, it's, yeah, but that's the calling of God. You can't get away from it. And those of us that are called, there's this attitude that I think echoes what the Apostle Paul said when he said, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. And for those of you that have been in this position before or currently are, there is that calling inside of you that you cannot escape. And some of you in this congregation this morning have that. You possess that. God is stirring that in you right now. That's a really good thing. So we're going to take time to identify the gifts and calling and have them attend monthly elder meetings. Um, We're going to this is just kind of a broad step here, um, just continued preparation. That, that's going to include meetings, just to talk about what the 
office entails, talk about what their responsibilities may be, talk about the theological concepts of eldership, so we'll work them through. Um, we have a curriculum that we actually work through um, that uh, I'm really excited about um, doing, and uh, so this is just a time of preparation. It may be a month, it may be two months, it just depends on how often we're able to meet and how many, you know, so we may schedule, hey, we got eight sessions we need to do, and as we work through the material, it may take a month, it may take two months at all. That's why I say that three to six month time period. I know it's a big um, time period, but um, it all depends on availability to uh, get through what we want to get through in the preparation stage, just to say, hey, this is, this is the next step. So, that's kind of those meetings where we go through the curriculum and, and prepare. And then we want to give each, um, as we're going through that process, we want to give um, potential elder candidates opportunities to teach you guys. Um, you guys need to identify the gifts. You guys need to identify the calling. At the end of the process, we're going to ask you to vote on these men. And so it's going to be hard to vote if you haven't had an opportunity to observe the giftedness. You haven't had an opportunity to observe that there's something in that guy's life that is a calling. And so there's a process of identifying the giftedness and calling that's so important. And this is, this is that process. So we're going to give them opportunities to teach. It, some of these guys that, that we'll go to are already teaching. Maybe it's an ABF class or something like that. Um, you may see them teach on uh, Sunday morning, but uh, it's going to be an opportunity for you guys to sit under their teaching and to hear them. And so we're going to give them that opportunity. So this is a big step. Step number two is the step wherein you will either, as a potential elder candidate, say, it's not for me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back out, or for the current elders to say, we just don't see the calling like maybe we thought we did, we don't see the giftedness there, or maybe it needs to be further developed, um, or it's that time period where we say, let's go to the next step. So step number two is, is, is probably the most crucial step in the, in the process. And uh, we want to be very careful with that. Um, once we get to step three, um, this is where we just test the doctrine. And so what we're going to ask is that candidates present their doctrinal statements for review and questioning. So as elders, we, um, we uh, protect and guard the doctrine of the church. And so this is a simple step of just, hey, where are you at in, 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 in the doctrines that are, are important and primary? And uh, can you defend those well? Um, so if a man is going to be put in the position of elder, they need to be able to defend their doctrine. They need to be able to defend what they believe. They need to be able to articulate what they believe in regards to the doctrines of the faith. And so this is just a, a time for candidates to present their doctrinal statements for review and questioning. Um, you guys will receive those doctrinal statements. You guys can look through those. Um, they'll probably be pretty simple. Um, you know, we're not asking them to write a 20-page paper on, you know, the uh, hypostatic union or anything like that, okay? Um, their, their, their perspective on antinomianism versus legalism. We're not asking for any of that. We're just asking for what do you believe in regards to the Trinity, in regards to the deity of Jesus, in regards to the major cardinal orthodox, orthodox historical doctrines of the faith, and just to make sure that you can articulate and defend those. And uh, so that's important. So that'll be just a time of testing doctrine. And so at that time, doctrinal statements are either approved or rejected, um, <clears throat> and we anticipate them being approved. So um, after all of that, the congregation then, that you, either approves and uh, confirms the appointment to the office. And so, a, a, a church me business meeting will be called. Um, I think per our bylaws, we give a couple weeks' notice, but you guys are going to know who the men are in this process early on, so we'll be communicating that with you. And then, uh, once a vote is taken and, and confirmed by the congregation, um, elders will lay on their hands, receive the new elders, and, uh, and uh, bring them into the office of elder. So, that's the process that we're going to begin to go through. Let me give you a time frame. We are... Um, uh, about to hit, well, actually, we're right now in June, June 1st today. So we're going to begin the process this summer, and uh, we're going to begin in the next uh, month or so identifying men, uh, approaching those men, and uh, beginning the process with them. Um, once we have done that, we are going to communicate to you different men that we've uh, approached and uh, men that are in the process, just so that you know, hey, these are the men that are going through the process so that when times come for them to teach or present doctrinal statements, everybody is aware of who those men are that are going through the process. And if any of those men uh, through that process um, back out, say, not for me or whatever, then we'll communicate that. Say, you know, so-and-so was in the process of elder candidacy um, and uh, they're no longer in the process, no problem, not a big deal, and, uh, because we, wanna, we want men that are called, gifted, and ultimately appointed by our congregation. So. Um, 
that's kind of the time frame. Um, when we will actually bring a, a men before you for a vote, I can't give you a, a, a date right now because we, uh, we don't know that time frame. But we're going to begin the process this summer and heading into the fall and the winter, um, we hope to uh, bring men before you for approval. If you have any questions about the process, uh, please uh, text those in. The number's up on the screen there. Um, you can write them in if you're not into texting, and uh, you can uh, um, write those questions in, and uh, we'll answer those um, along with some of the other questions that have been submitted. I know some of you submitted questions from last week's Church Matters. Uh, please, uh, uh, we're going to take one Sunday where we actually answer all of our questions and go through all of those. So, um, that being said, that's our process. So, I would ask you as a congregation to uh, do two things. If you're sitting here and uh, God has been stirring in your heart and working in your heart, this, this calling... Um, you know, it's okay to have a conversation and say, God's doing something here. Again, it's not men that are like, I get to make decisions. Yeah. Not, no. Those that are called know it. There's something that God does, the Spirit does in a man that's called. And if God is stirring that in you or has been stirring that in you, um, then, 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 then let us know. Um, some of you, we, we know that, and we're going to be approaching you. So, so be open to that. Second thing is um, just be in prayer for these decisions and these appointments as they're, they're important moving forward. Be in prayer for, for the men that will go through the elder candidacy and ultimately be approved. Be in prayer for those of us that are, that are walking men through this. It's, it's going to be an exciting time. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the process, to be honest with you. Um, for me, one of the passions that I have in ministry is developing new leadership, um, especially when I see young leadership or, or just current leadership. I love developing new leadership in the church, and I love walking men through, um, through stuff. It's just something that I have that I get excited about. So this whole process for me, I'm really excited about. I love the idea of it, and I love the idea of bringing men to just be uh, those who would serve with us for however long God has them. We don't set terms to our elders here. And uh, so we leave that up to God. And so um, it'll be men that'll be appointed until God removes them or they remove themselves, or which is ultimately God's decision anyway. So that's, uh, that's going to be the process. So pray for us and pray for these men as we, uh, as we head into the future.